Good morning, Commander Burbank. This is uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com. Tarek, good morning. Got you loud and clear. Oh, great. Well, uh, thank you so much for having some, uh, some time to talk with us today. And welcome, uh, welcome back to, uh, to Houston, obviously. Um, you know, I guess our first question is how, how has it been uh, uh, coming back home after uh, landing uh, uh, and, uh, and readapting to, you know, all the, 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 the minor details of life on Earth with gravity? Um, Gravity is probably the most challenging thing, I think. Um, compared to a shuttle mission, though, in some ways, it was probably a little bit easier. And it's because I think uh, now for the long duration missions, with the exercise equipment you got on board, you can act in the time that we devote to it every day, you can actually uh, finish out a mission and uh, and feel like you're you're fairly fit. It does take a little bit of time to get your uh, your gyros working properly again, but uh, after two weeks, I feel pretty much back to normal. That's, that's that's good to hear. Uh, has there been any um, unexpected side effects of, of getting back to Earth? Have you? Have you uh, I think some some folks have told us how you know, maybe uh, they they put a glass up in the air thinking it's going to float and and they forget that there is gravity. Anything like that? Uh, so far, none. Maybe because I'm I'm a little bit careful about it. I, uh, actually, after the after a shuttle mission, though, uh, occasionally that would that'd be the case. You'd be shaving in the morning and uh, <clears throat> put out a shaving. Uh, a can of shaving cream in front of you and expect it to float there. And uh, I haven't had anything like that this time. But, uh, you know, I, I feel very, very normal. Um, um, look forward very much to uh, to running every day, getting out and uh, and actually running and watching the world go by instead of running on a treadmill. So, uh, it's really, really pleasant, very nice. Well, now that, now that you're back, what, what, uh, what was the, the one thing, if there is one thing, that, that you can say that you missed that was – that was uh, uh, maybe like a, a small comfort uh, uh, of life on Earth, something that's obviously your family and friends, uh, but just one of those, those little things that, that you really just, when you got back, you're like, oh, I really missed this. Yeah, I, I think hands down family, um, the time that you spend away on station, actually the time that you spend away from family uh, during the couple of years of training leading up to your launch, um, that's, that's pretty tough. That's a, one of the toughest aspects, I think, of, uh, of long duration space flight right now. Um, but to get back and, and be with family again far and away is the, is the thing that's most precious, you missed most. Um, there's, there's a lot of things, the, the kinds of food that you might uh, eat here, um, that we've got a great selection on board, um, but, uh, but it still isn't quite the same as uh, having fresh vegetables, and, uh, and uh, so there's a lot of that that you, that you certainly enjoy. But there's an awful lot that we're able to do on, on Space Station right now. It's big and, uh, and uh, as well designed for long duration you know, crew uh, living. Um, it, the Space Station's actually uh, quite a nice place. Hey, what was that, that first uh, maybe Earth meal? That, that you requested when you when you got home, uh, either in Kazakhstan or, or in Houston. A meat lover's pizza. That was uh, <laughs> that was number one. Actually, before that, there actually was a uh, a, a T-bone steak too that we uh, we managed to uh, to track down on our on our flight back to Houston through uh, through Scotland, Presswick. Oh, that sounds that sounds tasty for sure. <laughs> um, you mentioned the space station, and uh, now that you've flown on both, uh, you know, the, the short duration and long duration, I, I'm wondering what was. Um, uh, your favorite aspect of, of both uh, flying to the station and and then also serving as as its commander there, uh, and now that you've had some time to kind of reflect on it, I think for everybody that that does a short duration mission, everybody that's been to space station, maybe had a hand in uh, some of the assembly work on space station. I think for all of us, uh, you, you always wonder what it would be like to spend enough time up there to really adapt to space, to really become, you know, a creature of space in a way, to become very good at living up there, and. Um, the views of planet Earth are, are unbelievable through the cupola, and those are, are, uh, are something that'll, that'll always mean a lot to you. But I think just living and working up there, getting very good at it, doing the science you do on Space Station, making it become a home for you, that you really feel uh, as much at home in, as uh, capable as, uh, as you would in any environment you've ever been on planet Earth, to go through that transition, which does take some time, that's probably one of the one of the really neatest, most rewarding aspects, and it, it requires being up there, you know, certainly a lot longer than two weeks. Great, thanks. You know, one thing we did because we, we knew that we were going to be uh, speaking with you uh, today is we asked um, uh, our Space.com readers uh, if there are any questions they would ask you if if they could, and they sent us some some really interesting ones. And and, and if, it's, if it's all right, I'd hope to to ask them um, uh, to you at least a, a few of them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 
I mean, to start off, John, uh, thank you, for, by the way. Uh, John uh, Ruko, he, he, he mentioned that he's heard about the high-speed particles that astronauts sometimes see, those flashes of light. I think yeah. I've seen um, Don Pettit write about them as well. Um, and he, he was wondering if, if you experienced any of that, and if so, how often uh, it might happen if it's a nuisance or anything. Um, we, there's some different words for it. It's Cherenkov radiation. It's, um, uh, we call them uh, phosphenes. And what it really is is um, radiation that's, uh, that could be galactic cosmic rays. It could be um, uh, particles from the solar wind. And uh, these interact with uh, the, basically the fluid inside the eye. And it's the, same, it's the same kind of phenomenon that you might see if you've ever seen uh, photos or video of uh, the cooling water in reactors, nuclear reactors, for example. It's the, uh, the bluish glow that you would see there. And essentially, these, um, these radiation particles will uh, interact with, the, uh, again, the fluid in the eye. And uh, you don't see it as blue. You'll see it as, um, as glowing flashes. It would be similar to... To me, what it, what it looks like is if you're flying in an airplane at high altitude and you see a thunderstorm in the distance, and if there's a, a lightning you know, bolt inside the thunderstorm, kind of that sort of um, that uh, glowing, diffuse um, flash that you'll see. So it's not something your eyes can focus on. It's not something uh, that you see in, as a point source, and it's not something you see certainly as a, as a ray, but you see it as kind of a, a glowing flash. You'll notice it when... Uh, when the space station um, or the space shuttle go through what we call the South Atlantic Anomaly. It's a, it's a slight depression in the magnetosphere of Earth where a lot of these charged particles actually will, uh, w during their trajectory from the North and South Pole, will actually uh, impinge a little bit onto the orbit of the space station. So um, if you're dark adapted, if you're getting ready to go to sleep, for example, and your eyes have become you know, more sensitive and you're in a dark environment, you'll notice them more and you'll just see a few of them. And, uh, and it, it's kind of contingent upon how energetic the sun may be, um, what the radiation flux is, and, um, and it's, it's a very interesting effect. And it's not all that frequent, though. Yeah. Great. Well, well th thanks for that. That's, uh, I think that's the first time I've heard it described uh, as blue. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty neat. Um, uh, Christopher Nguyen, he, he was wondering what, what your ambitions uh, or what you, what you see as, as the, the key ambition that you would like uh, human spaceflight or, or spaceflight in general to to see to to reach for or, or achieve in, in like the next 30 years right I, I think it's um, I think this is something extremely valuable to to us as human beings to us as Americans I think spaceflight is is really our destination it's where human beings need to need to go next and uh, and I think when I was growing up as a kid I thought that by this time we would have thousands and thousands of people living in space, living on the moon, living on Mars, etc. Well, it turns out space flight's a, a pretty tough thing. Um, so it's not the kind of thing that uh, maybe things didn't progress quite as quickly as I'd like. But we're now to a point where commercial companies now can take over the piece of getting from, from the surface of planet Earth to low Earth orbit and can essentially set the stage for NASA to take the next big step. And I think we'll do that in an international way. I think, um, I think in the next coming decades, we will see people living on the moon, on Mars, and we'll visit asteroids. And I think that is really our destination. I think all the things that you get out of spaceflight, um, uh, the technology that you get from that, um, but, uh, but in a more ethereal way. I think the benefits to humankind are in expanding our horizons, and, uh, and that's what I'd like to see us do in the coming decades. You know, we had a related question from Nathan Wise, and he, he, he wanted to know specifically about the, private, the, private, the privatization of space. We know that SpaceX is going to launch later this, uh, this month with the, the first Dragon uh, uh, capsule. Uh, the, the orbital capsule is going to launch later in the year. Um, and, and we just saw the, the new SpaceX man capsule as well. Um, you know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm worried as, as a NASA astronaut, not worried, uh, uh, interested as a, as a NASA astronaut, what your thoughts are uh, to, to, to ride on a, a, a private capsule um, and what it means to have more than one uh, a group with a, a spacecraft for the United States. I probably speak for a lot of us that, that have been doing this business for a while, and, uh, and, I, and I think riding on any space vehicle would be great. You want to make sure they're safe. You want to make sure that, uh, that the vehicles have all the redundancy they need to have so that you can safely get to and from space, not just for ourselves, but what that means for the future of, uh, of space travel. Um, I think 
the more means, the more ways that we have to get to space, the better. It's, um, we, we don't want to have only a single way to do it. And I think for us, in our, in our own personal interests as Americans, I think it's good for us to have American-built vehicles as well. But, um, but again, I believe it's a, this is the kind of thing that we do as a, as a human species. So um, I am happy to see us have more and more capability to get to low Earth orbit. I think, I think it's probably the job of, of countries and the job of space agencies to invest in the, the, the hardest thing. And right now I think the hardest thing is leaving low Earth orbit and going into deep space. So the, the space launch system, which will give us heavy lift capability to get lots of hardware up into low Earth orbit that we can then take to the Moon and Mars and uh, in asteroids, I think that is really the purview of NASA. And having a deep space uh, spacecraft like Orion, the multipurpose crew vehicle, is uh, the thing to do there. But We've gotten to the point in space exploration, I think, where commercial companies can, can take over that piece, again, from low Earth orbit, uh, or from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit, and NASA and other space agencies can contract that out. And it will also give the, you know, the, those commercial entities the capability of, of uh, selling those services um, to other folks, maybe not space, in, um, you know, space uh, agencies per se. And uh, the more people we have in space, the better it is, I think, for all of us. Well, Commander Burbank, you know, th th thank you so much. I could ask you questions all day, but I know that uh, my, my time, unfortunately, is, is, is up. Um, welcome back again. All the best, and we look forward to, uh, to your next space flight. Tarek, thanks very much. It was good talking with you today. Thank you.